Hello everyone, welcome to the fifth episode of Ilam Istanbul Talks. This is Faruk Yasachiman talking, um, Assistant Professor of Ottoman History at Ibn Khaldun University and Editor-in-Chief of PoliticsToday.org. Today we have a distinguished guest, Professor R R uh, Richard Bullitt. Uh, let me introduce you Professor Bullitt very briefly. He is currently an Emeritus Professor at Columbia University Department of History. Uh, Professor Bullitt is a historian of mid medieval Middle East with an interest in social and institutional history of Islam, the history of technology, and environmental history as part of an increasing trend in global history writing in the United States and, uh, well, uh, well, Western Europe. And with a special focus on the role of animals in human society, Professor Bullitt gave many talks and lectures and wrote many books on those subjects. And here are the titles of some of his books that I want to share with you. Uh, Hunters, Herders, Hamburgers, The Camel and the Wheel, Islam, The Weave from the Edge, The Case for Islam and Christian Civilization, Cotton Climate and Camels in Early Islamic History, The Earth and Its Peoples, The Global History, the Wheel, Inventions and Reinventions, and lastly, uh, Methodists and Muslims, My Life as an Orientalist. Um, this is the latest, Professor, correct me if I'm wrong, that appeared last year, a memoir of yours, your academic adventure. Yes, sir. Uh, great. Uh, additionally, a Professor has many academic and non-academic publications in journals and newspapers. Also author of novels such as Chakra, The, the One Donkey Solution and others. Today we are honored to have Professor Bullitt, a distinguished academic with us, a 50-year career at Harvard, Berkeley and Columbia with an immense experience. So what will imbue from this long career for us today is transportation in early Islamic history and the place of camel caravans in it. A rare animal on earth may be falling most victim to orientalist stereotypes in history. And Professor Bullitt will give us a different perspective on this. With no further ado, Professor, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Farouk. And thanks to Elam for inviting me to give this talk. It's a, a great pleasure to be with you. Our pleasure. My career started out in medieval Islamic history and gradually evolved into a career devoted to world history uh, or global history, depending on how you want to phrase it. A basic principle of world history that I rely on is the idea that every human society <clears throat> has, a, has an energy profile. That is to say you can list the forms of energy that are exploited within that society. And you can give a, a priority to which ones are more important and which ones are less important. From the earliest period, uh, clearly human muscle power was the primary form of energy that people had. Uh, at a certain point, they begin to have fire, and so they can uh, use the energy of fire. They have the kinetic energy of running water uh, in rivers, so they can move things on rivers, and they can use wind power um, to move things over uh, lakes and oceans. Animal power comes next, and animal power has been um, a constant uh, really from about um, oh, 4000 BC. Uh, until now, although much less important now than it once was. And uh, the uh, importance of animal power um, varies according to what the, uh, the, the uses are and uh, what society um, uh, involves itself with, uh, with the animals. I'm going to talk today about camels. Uh, when I first suggested uh, over 50 years ago that I was going to write a book on the history of uh, camel use, the associate director of Harvard's Middle East Center called me in and said, 
do not write a book about camels. And he said, I said, why? And he said, well, because it's a stereotype and people in the area resent being associated with camels. And um, <clears throat> they will resent you if, you if you study camels. So I left his office absolutely determined to write a book on camels because I thought that these were um, ridiculous uh, limitations. As it turned out, the book I wrote, The Camel and the Wheel, um, came to be broadly accepted for its uh, thesis that uh, camel transport replaced wheel transport through the Middle East uh, sometime in the early centuries of the common era, before the rise of Islam. But then I got more interested in the specific issue of, uh, of, of the camel caravan and how it, how it functioned. If you wanted to move a, a quantity of goods, let's say a ton of something, uh, from one place to another place several hundred miles away in the year 100 of the Common Era, you probably would want to move it uh, by water because uh, floating it uh, or using wind power to move it uh, was an, an ideal way. It was a cost-free way of, of moving the goods. Or you could use a river uh, or a canal, and you could move, use the current of the river or the canal to, uh, to, to move the goods uh, on a boat. So it's not surprising that when you look at the Greco-Roman history of the Middle East and late antiquity, and you look at it from a transportation perspective, you're looking mostly at water transport in the Mediterranean Sea, on the Nile River, on the Tigris Euphrates, on the Black Sea, on the Caspian Sea, and uh, rivers coming uh, down into the Black Sea from, uh, from Russia. Uh, the history of transportation has uh, gained a great deal of attention uh, in that era of late antiquity, uh, in, in part because so many of the ruins of ships have been discovered by archeologists underwater, uh, many of them in um, on the Mediterranean, but also in, in the Black Sea. And so people have been able to, to say, well, what sorts of goods are carried, uh, uh, how many of them, so forth and so on. As the camel caravan came to uh, supplement and then to a large degree uh, replace uh, river and sea transport for long distance trade, there has been no equivalent <clears throat> appraisal of how that caravan network affected the society or how it affected the institutional organization um, of, of transportation. And this I think is unfortunate because as I look at it now, I think that the network of camel caravan uh, activity that came to stretch from Delhi in India to Timbuktu in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to um, Sigil Massa um, in Morocco, <clears throat> uh, that network is the largest network, the most extensive network of overland transportation um, that the world had seen uh, prior to the rise of the railroad. Um, and it involved not simply putting loads on camels, but it also involved having the camels um, move into areas where they had not previously been known or used for transportation. So if you look at, say, the year um, 500 BC, 500 before the Common Era, uh, you really would not find camel transport used all that extensively, except in Arabia and for two hump camels across Central Asia. But many of the areas that come to be important 
in the uh, camel caravan network are beyond the reach of Arabia or Central Asia. They include uh, one of camels uh, move into Iran, to Southern Afghanistan, to Pakistan, to Northwest India, uh, and westward, they move across Roman uh, North Africa, and then south of Sahara, uh, the camel uh, availability of camels moves across the highland areas from Darfur across to the Ahagar and uh, other highland air parts of the Sahara Desert. Now, this extension of the availability of camels uh, was no accident. Indeed, it probably could be compared to the Europeans bringing horses to the Western Hemisphere, that they changed the society in many ways simply by bringing an animal that had uh, uh, characteristics that no existing animal uh, had uh, into the North and South American areas. The camel uh, we take for granted, but we've never really had a geography that tells us when camels reached into um, areas that extended so far eastward from Arabia where they are native and so far westward uh, across to the Atlantic Ocean. But it does not appear that that extension eastward began substantially before the rise of Islam. Uh, so that, let's say, under the uh, Sassanid Empire in, in Persia, you did have some use of one hump camels by the time of the Arab conquest. But they were mostly animals that were raised in Iraq, uh, in the desert lands of Iraq. There were little evidence of camel breeding being done on the Iranian plateau area. Um, and an area that today, uh, for example, uh, is completely populated by one ump camels, Turkmenistan, was at that time occupied by two ump camels, which are much more uh, resistant to cold because Turkmenistan is uh, much farther north than uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Now, as the camels became broadly available, what were their advantages? Well, when you look at the energy profile and you look at animal energy or human energy, muscle power, uh, you think of the cost in terms of uh, food and water and shelter um, because you can only work uh, to a certain degree before you need to replenish the source of the energy. So if you wanted to carry a large quantity of goods from, let us say, um, Northeast Iran to Baghdad, um, there are no rivers that you can follow. There's no sea route. Uh, you have to carry things overland. If you were to carry them overland using humans carrying goods themselves, either backpacks or carrying them on their heads, or possibly uh, carrying a litter with goods on top of it, you would quickly find that the need for food and water for the human porters uh, was so extensive that you couldn't carry very much because you had to have food and water. You could only go, um, to, let's say, 20 miles a day. And so if you're going to go 1,000 miles, uh, it takes many, many days <clears throat> to get where you're going. So when you had people who were simply carrying goods um, on their backs, uh, the, the logic is that they would carry very small amounts of very high value goods like uh, gemstones uh, from Afghanistan, like lap lapis lazuli, for example, that we know was used in, uh, in ancient Iraq. Uh, or they might carry, carry pearls from the Persian Gulf eastward. Um, but you wouldn't carry things that weighed very much because the value of the goods would be um, overwhelmed by the cost of the food and water that you need to have for the porters. If you replace them with donkeys, 
uh, it does not improve things very much. A donkey does not carry a great deal more than a human being does. And to have a train of donkeys um, would require a certain number of humans who would be uh, controlling the donkeys. And so you'd still have to have food and drink for the humans, and you would have to have nourishment for the donkeys wherever you, uh, wherever you stopped for the night. If you came, come to camels, however, you have an extraordinary uh, benefit because you can move goods for hundreds of miles using an animal that does not need to be fed by anything that you're carrying along. If they're going to feed along the way, you can let them loose at night with the uh, hobbled um, front leg and they can graze on whatever is available because the camels will find something to eat pretty much wherever they are. But they can also go for literally weeks without eating, uh, which was true very much of the, uh, of the camels, of the Bactrian, the Tuump camels in Central Asian uh, Silk Road trade. They also can go without water. It is well known, of course, that camels uh, can do without water for extensive periods of time, particularly in cool weather. And um, they do this through scientific uh, physiological uh, uh, specializations that have been well studied. So we know exactly why they can uh, do without uh, water. But from a point of view of, of transportation, you have an exceedingly strong animal uh, next to an elephant, can, uh, really extraordinarily strong. Uh, uh, you know, not as strong as an elephant, but stronger than anything else. The, the spine of, the, of a camel uh, tips slightly upward so that it has a structural support for carrying a load up to 500 pounds. Well, um, if you can move 500 pounds of goods from uh, one place to a, a far distant place, let's say a, a, a thousand miles away, and you move them at 20 miles a day, and you don't have to feed or water the animals uh, beyond uh, occasional uh, opportunities, you have essentially a cost-free transportation system. Um, there was actually a study done by a professor at Pennsylvania University and some colleagues in Pakistan of the budget for um, using camels in southern Pakistan. This is done in the 1990s. And the budget showed that you had a certain cost for buying the animal, a certain cost for the equipment, the saddle that the camel would use. But when it listed uh, 340 working days, a uh, cost of feed zero, and then the non-working days, the cost of feed was zero because the camels would graze in the desert and they would not need to be uh, any special feeding. So you don't have any cost. Well, this isn't quite like wind power or solar power, but it is to some degree a, um, a nearly cost-free transportation system. So to move a thousand pounds of goods or 2,000 pounds, a ton of goods from Northeast Iran to Baghdad, uh, you might uh, do this um, with a fairly small number of animals. And um, the, the cost is comparatively uh, negligible. Now, I think there was a clear consciousness in the period of the rise of Islam that uh, long distance transportation with uh, camel caravans competed with transportation by river and by sea. Um, the merchants who traded goods by sea and along rivers, or primarily by sea, uh, were the paramount merchants of late antiquity. They're the ones that seem to have become the wealthiest. They seem to have dominated the, uh, the long-distance trade. And the most important cities 
were seaports. So you have uh, like uh, Istanbul or um, Rome with its port of Ostia or um, Alexandria. Uh, seaports uh, become the the center of civilization or the center of, uh, of prosperous culture uh, when you have seaborne trade. But you also have certain problems, piracy, uh, weather problems. Uh, seaborne trade was not without its, its drawbacks. When the, uh, when the people who were engaged in the expansion of Islam that we often refer to as the Arab conquests, um, they were quite aware that um, that caravan traffic with camels uh, had advantages that the seaborne trade did not have. And I think that they deliberately uh, promoted um, the use of camel caravans. They were, many of them, actual merchants from Mecca. They were people who were uh, quite aware that there was a, um, a relationship between moving goods by camels and moving them by ships because the Quran uh, refers to the camel uh, with uh, a, a word for ship. The ship of the desert is, as we put it in English. So they are aware of that. They also, um, I think, were deliberately um, focused on how the new uh, religion that they were part of and that they were part of the extension of, uh, how that would fit with a change in the long distance uh, transportation um, system of the Middle East. Uh, basically, I, I think that the the dear disappearance of the wheel and the and the rise to dominance of the camel caravan that I wrote about in the Camel and the Wheel half a century ago, I think that the spread of uh, the Arab merchants who were the carriers of Islam throughout the uh, the Middle East uh, is the ultimate uh, result of that, that it's taking people who were uh, already becoming important in the um, in the in the economy, and they are moving from being having a, a rising and dominant role in the economy to having a rising and then dominant role in the uh, in the political life as well. So, if you were a merchant, uh, I've become interested most recently in the um, in those laws in Islam that are referred to as hudud. These are uh, a, a, li a very small list of uh, penalties uh, or of um, misdeeds that have specific penalties that are associated with the earliest phase of Islamic law. Um, they are not, they are never listed as such as a group in the Quran. Uh, but by the time of the rise of the Sharia, in the, let's say, mid to late 700s, um, a century or more after the, uh, the death of the Prophet, um, they're already taken as being an accepted group. They're listed many times in Hadith as being uh, these, it's understood, these are the, uh, the things that the Quran specifies for, for punishment. But if you look at what they are, it, it raises certain questions as to who put together that list. We don't know who put together the list. I don't think there's any source that actually names a particular person who, uh, who said, these are the hudud. Um, and you find that, uh, for example, there's a great deal of concern about uh, the chastity of a wife. Uh, and you needed to have uh, four adult male witnesses to an act of of uh, of um, fornication uh, in order to to exact a very uh, uh, dangerous penalty. Uh, but presumably, for a man who stayed at home, um, 
if he were suspicious of his wife, he would not call in four neighbors to take a look. Uh, this is largely for men who are away from home a great deal. Uh, and caravan merchants were often away for months, sometimes for years. Uh, so I think that uh, the hudud for accusation of adultery and for false accusation of adultery um, makes sense, particularly for people, men who are away from home a great deal. Um, uh, then you had a, um, a penalty for cutting the road, explicitly cutting the road. It is not for breaking into a home. It's not for kidnapping someone, um, but it's specifically for cutting the road, as if the road somehow was uh, particularly important for, uh, for the people who were uh, looking to the Quran for guidance. And I think, again, uh, this is uh, important for caravan traders because bandits are a constant uh, threat. And you don't have a court, you don't have a, um, a prison. Uh, if there are bandits uh, who cut the road, they need to be dealt with when they are found. You cannot simply let them go. So that fits. And you can go through the list of hudud and find uh, ways in which they, uh, that they suggest that this may be a code of law that originates from the Quran, but is specifically present in the mind of long distance, uh, long distance uh, caravan merchants. Uh, the last one I'll mention in this is the prohibition on the drinking of wine. This is uh, nowhere near the, the scale of penalty uh, that you would have for cutting the road or for uh, adultery. But nevertheless, it is listed as one of the hudud. Uh, and yet it is not um, that clear in the Quranic passages uh, exactly what constitutes uh, the penalty of, uh, of drinking wine. Public humiliation is what develops in the form of flogging. But I think it's, I'm increasingly of the opinion that the specifying of wine was a commercial act supported within Quranic verse, uh, but it was a commercial act by merchants who were competing with seaborne transport. If you wanted to move wine, um, you mostly moved it in large, ceramic jars called amphorae. Um, the, the number of amphorae, you could pack hundreds of them into a boat. And when you got to the other end, you drank the wine and you simply uh, cast aside the amphora because it was uh, a cheap ceramic vessel. And when we find un underwater uh, ships, cargoes, will often find you know, dozens and dozens of amphorae, and they were used primarily to carry wine. And so uh, a city like Rome or a, um, a, a river city uh, like um, uh, Arles in, the, um, in France would have whole piles of broken amphorae from the wine trade. And the wine merchants, became very wealthy. But you cannot carry liquids very well by camel caravan. I think that this is um, fairly apparent uh, in that we have no images um, from the Islamic period that show uh, camel caravans loaded with amphorae. Uh, you could use animal skins to carry a liquid. But skins, of course, have the problem that they, uh, they will leak if they're not carefully handled. And unlike putting a load in a boat and carrying that load from, say, Istanbul to Rome, um, you do not have to, you load it at one end, you unload it at the other. But with a animal caravan, you have to unload the animal every night and then load it again the next morning. So you have a great deal more handling. So we don't see images of animals carrying uh, bulging skins 
of wine uh, or amphorae of wine. You do have um, an association of wine with the uh, caravan trade across Central Asia, the Silk Road, but that has more to do with the spread of grapes than with the wine uh, itself being carried. You would, people would learn from caravan traders that there were grapes they could grow, then they could make wine, but you did not carry wine from, uh, from Bukhara to Beijing, uh, you would carry grapes or raisins. Um, so I think that the, um, that the prohibition on wine in Islam and the emphasis on, uh, on public humiliation for wine drinking, uh, again, can be tied to the rise of a new merchant network uh, based on, uh, on caravan trading. The, the results of this um, over a period of time um, are very important, but not often pointed out. Uh, I'll single out two of the results. Uh, the first of them is that inland cities away from seaports become important in the early Islamic period and moving forward to a degree that they never had before, while seaports uh, have their importance shrink so that Alexandria dwindles while Cairo grows. Uh, in Tunisia, Kairouan, an inland city, becomes the main center of, uh, of uh, Muslim uh, governance. Uh, further west, you have in Algeria of Tahert, Morocco, you have Sigil Massa, inland cities known for their involvement with caravan trading whereas the, the port cities um, become less and less important. Uh, as you go uh, eastward, the most important cities of Iran, in many cases, uh, are inland cities. Um, uh, you do, you, in fact, Iran has very few uh, port cities. So that when you have cities that grow from maybe 10,000 at the time of the Arab uh, conquest of Iran to 100 to 200,000 uh, 200 years later, as happened with Ray, as happened with Nishapur, as happened with um, uh, certain other cities, Yazd, Qashan, um, you realize that uh, these inland cities, uh, which become very important culturally, and very important commercially, could not sustain that if they did not have a cheap mode of transportation that would allow you to have an interchange uh, across uh, very large distances that were not accessible by water transport. And we know from looking at the enormous volume of information about the careers of Islamic scholars of the ulama in the medieval period we know that they moved typically from city to city to city to collect the hadith of the prophet. Um, but when you look at the routes they follow, uh, these are overland routes, um, often through uh, rather barren stretches of territory. Uh, these, are not, these are not routes from one seaport to the next seaport, which say would have been the case in the Roman period or in the Greek period around the Mediterranean. Also, it became possible for these inland cities to, go, to become very large because the cost of bringing um, uh, food and charcoal and building equipment from the countryside into the city was cheaper if they were brought on camels uh, for cities that did not have uh, uh, navigable bodies of water. In the pre-Islamic period, almost all cities of any size anywhere in the world were on some sort or near some sort of body of water where they could have goods brought to the city from the immediate hinterland or from farther away. But with the rise of Islam, you start to have inland cities in which the local river or stream is fairly unimportant, or it may even only 
have water in it during a certain season of the year. But, and yet the city can grow to an enormous size because it is comparatively so cheap to bring goods into the city. So the shift from the seaports to the inland uh, geography, that, that's a hallmark of, uh, of, the, of Islamic history of the Middle East, as opposed to the Greco-Roman history that preceded it, um, or the Mesopotamian and Egyptian history. Um, this is a, a function of the, of the cost, the low cost of moving goods overland. Now, a second consequence that uh, I don't think has been uh, attended to enough <clears throat> is that the only way this system works, the camel caravan system, is if the camels are raised um, in a countryside <clears throat> that does not have any other uh, productive purpose, whether it's a desert or a semi-desert, um, doesn't make much difference. The camels will find something to eat wherever they are. But um, the important thing is that they're eating food that is not usable for other livestock, uh, not usable for humans, uh, the desert vegetation. They're grazing over very large territories of land that would not be usable for other animals. And if you don't have that kind of, of grazing situation, that kind of breeding situation, uh, then the camel caravan system doesn't work. Uh, for example, in Australia, uh, at the end of the 19th century, large numbers of camels were imported from Pakistan um, to, um, to Australia. They were used for building roads, used for ultimately building railroads. And then finally, they were released into the wild when trucking and trains made them no longer necessary. But if you look at the animal censuses for Australia, what you find is that they never, there was never a breeding system in Australia. They simply relied upon the deserts of Pakistan to produce the animals that they needed for developing Australia. Only after the camels were released into the wild did they multiply on their own and become uh, one of the world's larger populations of, uh, of um, feral camels, um, the world's largest uh, population of feral camels. So you needed to have people who would be willing to breed the camels and live in a very uh, materially deprived environment, whether a desert or um, semi-desert. Um, you had to have those people because your transportation system depended upon the animals that they produced. What this meant was that the, the Islamic civilization that develops um, not only uh, incorporates uh, animal breeding tribes, but it depends upon them. You had to have Arab tribes or Baluchi tribes or Turkmen tribes. You had to have the people who would live uh, in the desert and produce the animals that would uh, that would service this long distance trade. And it's, it's extraordinary. Uh, as an author of a world history textbook, um, through a number of author meetings with uh, publishers, I've discovered that there's an aversion in many quarters to using the word tribe to refer to a, uh, a kin related uh, ethnic group, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, some people feel that tribe deprives a group of, of uh, kind of the status of being a nation or being a people. In sub-Saharan Africa, in uh, North and South America, tribe is thought of as somehow a term used by European colonialists to, uh, to demean uh, indigenous peoples who now want to be considered to be nations or peoples uh, and so on. And the same thing is true to some degree in other parts of the world. You also have anthropologists who have complained that uh, the term tribe is a demeaning um, uh, orientalist term. But in the Middle East, I, I recently did a sort of um, 
informal survey on Facebook to see how people felt about the fact that in the Middle East, the word tribe is alive and well, or at least it's alive. Uh, tribalism is not very attractive, but um, in, even though the word is often used. But people would say, well, there's, what's wrong with the tribe? Uh, uh, Kabila, good Arabic term. But, but there's nothing wrong with that word. And I think it's partly because the, the society that the, uh, that the Muslims built in the Middle East after the rise of Islam um, integrated uh, people who were marginalized in other parts of the world as somehow more primitive or um, less able than settled people. Uh, they, in other parts of the world, uh, animal breeders were often marginalized, whereas here in the Islamic world, they were really central. And there was no shame about talking about a tribal dynasty or a um, or uh, the importance of a person's uh, tribal background. So I think that there are. Uh, this is one of the residues that that continues. That um, this is a society that um, has accepted a great diversity of people of very different levels of um, of economic activity and um, and social uh, organization uh, from the highest levels in great capital cities like uh, Cairo or Baghdad or Nishapur or Istanbul uh, to um, to tribes people who who live uh, who live in the countryside um, and the idea that the that the tribes people are they might be hard to control and certainly governments over time would have to work from time to time to to assert their their uh, their interest on, over the tribal people and sometimes the tribal people would win in that confrontation but by and large they become accepted as part of the society so I think that um, those are just two of the um, of the examples that of how the caravan network that comes into being um, uh, creates a broader society, whether at the urban level down to the tribal level, uh, that that works and is integrated in a way that you would not find in Europe or East Asia. Uh, that this is a particular aspect of the uh, of the developments in early uh, in early Islam. So I think perhaps I'll uh, I'll stop here, Farouk, and um, um, give you or others a chance to uh, to raise issues. Thank you for this very interesting uh, talk, Professor. Um, I, well, personally, I was astonished to see how capable the camels as animals were in well, facilitating cost-effective transportation. And these are opening ways to some other changes in the past. And, and I'm very much interested with that part. Uh, well, first of all, there is an anecdote that I want to, uh, well, ask, actually. In, while I remember while reading Fernand Brodel's book on uh, memory and the Mediterranean, um, there, there is one word, it's not verbatim what he wrote, it's my rough, very rough translation. He says, in the roots of Islam, there are deserts and caravans and a long history behind. But Islam means more. It means lands captured easily by Arab horsemen and camel riders. Um, so is... <laughs> It, it, was there any link between your interest in um, camel caravans and this Fernand Brodel's um, this assessment? Uh, I just wondered that as an anecdote first. Actually, not. I think that um, there has been a sort of romantic attachment to the idea of the the nomad um, um, being a. a a desert warrior and so forth, uh, which there's a certain truth to that. But in terms of the um, of the relationship to the uh, to the rise of Islam, um, 
it appears that the uh, there was a certain mobility that the camel gave that helped, uh, for example, move an army from Syria across to Iraq or vice versa. But when it came to to actual combat, uh, normally a rider who who had come by a camel um, would get off the camel and get on a horse for battle. Uh, horses um, were a more effective uh, battlefield instrument. Camels could carry their equipment, however, and that was um, important, not simply for carrying equipment to the battle, but one of the most important <coughs> economic impacts of the rise of Islam had to do with the uh, with the uh, ghanima, with the loot, the booty, that was taken away from the battle by the winners. Distributing that uh, tangible booty uh, among the people who had fought was a very important aspect of the uh, of the Arab conquests because um, because the um, um, the, the, the division of that loot among the warriors gave warriors the impetus, the desire to continue on to the next battle. But what would happen? You fought in a battle, battle's over. Now you, your share is that you have, uh, you have a, uh, a slave woman, you have four goats, and you have two swords that you picked up. That you, that's your share. But what do you do with those? Um, in order to, uh, basically, those had to be turned into money. So you would have to have um, people who would come with their camels that could load up all this stuff, uh, pay the person a limited amount of money uh, for his share of the loot, then carry the loot off to a city where it could be sold for a higher amount of money. And we know that there were certain uh, companions of the prophet who actually did um, make a great deal of money on being uh, brokers of, uh, of uh, the remains of, of battle. So being able to carry things into and out of battle was important. And yet other armies managed to, uh, to do that as well. So I wouldn't single that out as, a, as one of the most salient aspects of camel use in battle. All right. Thank you. By the way, our listeners, you can write your questions to chat box, and I'm going to um, read them here to for, to Professor. Uh, professor, by by the way, I have another question in terms of methods. Uh, that this sound uh, this looks both old and new to me. Uh, while old in the sense that this is um, one of a structuralist analysis of the past. So we have camel caravans that are um, uh, becoming dominant, open in the ways for the Muslim early Muslim conquests. They're setting the ground, being the infrastructural reasons as facilitators behind the uh, uh, the, the conquests, maybe. Or I mean, it was already on the way. On the other hand, this looks like a new uh, kind of. Uh, well, method that is, well, that today's historians theme as environmental history on the one hand, because you are interested in the animals, the role of animals in, in human societies. So, and, and you wrote this thesis uh, very early, right? I mean, four decades ago. Uh, well, um, so how... Well, that's interesting, um, and this overlap is very peculiar to me. I mean, the method on the one hand, there's there's an influence of structural uh, perspective, and the other hand, we have very new um, that will well well expand its influence in the two thousands, and you have both of them at the same time. How could this become? Well. Um... I can't attribute it to my education. As I pointed out, I was discouraged from ever working on camels yeah. when I started. Um, but 
one day when I was uh, sitting at home in my family home, I tried to remember the Arabic word for wheel. And I discovered I couldn't remember it. I thought, five years, six years of studying Arabic, and I can't come up with the word for wheel in classical Arabic. Uh, either I'm an idiot uh, and a terrible student, or there weren't, or I never ran into the word. Uh, and the more I looked into it, I thought, I can't remember ever seeing the wheel mentioned in a medieval uh, text of the sort that we had as the basic for studying uh, classical Arabic. And so then it struck my mind as, well, maybe there weren't any wheels. Obviously there were potter's wheels and there were water wheels and, uh, and so on. That There was no lack of rotating systems, but there didn't appear to be any transport. Uh, and then I started to look, well, was there a word for a wheel right for someone who makes wheels? Uh, were there wheel were there words relating to um, to the vehicle itself? I mean, Araba, of course, becomes a modern word. Um, uh, Sayara, again, a modern word doesn't specifically refer to wheels. Uh, in Tunisia, I found that they used the word carita, which is Latin. Uh, from the Roman period when they had carts, you mean camel carts in Tunisia. Uh, so then I thought, but in the in ancient Near East, there were chariots, there were ox carts. We have pictures of them. We have texts that refer to them. So where did all the chariots and all the ox carts go? And I concluded that they disappeared. And I wondered why they disappeared. Uh, Interestingly, I, many years later, I found a little article in the Encyclopedia of Islam where Maxime Rodasson had said, it's curious that all the wheels seem to be disappeared. Somebody should look into that. But he didn't look into it, so it was left for me to look into it. And I found that I could only explain the disappearance of the wheel by the rise of camel caravans. And that required a reconstruction of the history of camels which since they do not read or write, uh, that, that history was a history, a history of technology. You had images, but those images, the, the way you determined how the camel was used was by the design of the saddles that were put on the camel. So I had to get into the history of technology and the, uh, the history of animals. You know, why, when did camels become, uh, become a domestic animal? And then, of course, that extended into the Sahara Desert on in the west and off into Central Asia uh, and uh, as far as the frontier of China in the east. So my, my, my historical method, if there is such a thing for me, is to think of problems that nobody's thought of and then try and solve them. And this was sort of the first of a, of a number that I, that I went through of something striking me as being peculiar that needed explanation. Now, the fact that uh, that the technology of camels and the, of camel saddles and the technology of wheeled vehicles and the, uh, the zoology of animal domestication and the animal husbandry, how animals are used, the fact that those have subsequently become important to the field at large was something I never would have anticipated at the time I started on these inquiries, which seemed to many people at that time to be a very peculiar subjects to be addressing. But I think it's part of the growth of world history as a field of study. Um, in the, when I came to my department at Columbia University, uh, in the mid 1970s, it was a department of mostly older professors who were heavily involved in diplomatic history, uh, military history, um, uh, biography of great men, uh, um, political history. And over the course of the 1980s, um, that, de that department underwent a shift 
from, uh, from those topics to new topics explored by wonderful new faculty that primarily focused on class, race, and gender. And class, race, and gender became the three great topics of the 80s and the 90s that um, uh, to write about and discover uh, what people other than dominant white European males had done in the world was a, a wonderful program for historical research. But as the tendency toward world history gained, uh, gained headway in the 1990s, um, it became apparent, at least to some of us, that class, race, and gender were all quite relevant, but there wasn't always a lot to say. Um, uh, the upper class always abused the lower class. The white people always abused the dark people. The men always abused the women. Um, that seemed to be sort of givens, and, all, and you could talk about the nuances or the permutations on that. But the basic uh, um, structures seemed to be uh, fairly universal. But when it came to material culture, that was different. You actually had major material differences. So that, um, uh, you know, I explore the material differences in terms of, uh, of animal breeding and in terms of transportation. But uh, there are many other material differences uh, as well. And um, uh, right at the moment, the research I'm doing has to do with, um, with Islam in the Southern Philippines. And before we started on this conversation today, I was writing about, um, about the use of the viola in uh, the Sulu uh, archipelago of the Southern Philippines and how in the world did a European musical instrument come to the Philippines and get integrated into a society um, that uh, did not use uh, stringed instruments in its, in its music before then. So when you look at the uh, material goods, um, uh, there you have major differences from one society to another. Um, and that's the reason I started out by talking about uh, uh, energy profiles because the way in which uh, societies exploit the energy uh, resources that they have is really very distinctive and worth looking into more. I, my own feeling has been that um, uh, with all due respect to the Marxist tradition of organizing the world according to means of production and a um, sequence of, um, you know, from slavery to feudalism to um, uh, capitalism to communism. Um, the classic economists of the 19th and uh, well, the late 18th and 19th century paid much more attention to industry, to producing goods, than they did to moving goods. And I think that um, in some ways, if you look at the movement of goods as an industry, as opposed to simply the production of goods, you have other, um, other modes of production that, uh, that could, be, could be singled out. Because if you produce goods, uh, the, not the quantity of goods you produce is directly related to your market, to having consumers who people want to use those goods. And that has to do with your ability to deliver those goods from your place of production to a place of consumption. But that's transportation. And transportation, you know, Adam Smith never talks about uh, transportation. Um, even the steamship was too, uh, you know, really wasn't quite there for the next decade, you got steamships. Uh, Karl Marx didn't write much about railroads because they were just on their way during his heyday. But um, by the time you got to the Dow Jones Industrial Average, 
uh, at the uh, end of the 19th century. The initial listing uh, that Dow came up with of to give a sense of the market was a list of mostly um, railroads, um, means of transportation, not means of production. And then the transportation index was removed as a separate index from the industrial index. And so you now have a Dow Industrials and Dow Transportation. And if you look today, the Dow Transportation Index is still based primarily on transportation, whereas the industrial index now has conglomerates that, uh, like, for example, Amazon, that both that don't do that much production, they do a lot of, of distribution. And I think that, um, that on the whole, the economic historians uh, need to look more at, at distribution systems and the, uh, the modes of transportation that they use in order to have a better um, picture of how the world becomes integrated uh, over a course of time. So today we have these issues of, um, of supply chain. That's fundamentally, this is a transportation issue where you have these container ships lined up in San Diego, uh, you know, going out into the ocean. And um, I, I think that the economic historians uh, need to look at the structures of, of distribution and the material side of transportation. Um, and the, uh, uh, the social historians, I think, at least for the Islamic world, uh, need to look at the integration between levels of um, two different aspects of society. Uh, many years ago, in the, late, in the early 1970s, I taught for a couple of years at Berkeley. <clears throat> and I went to a conference at UCLA on nomadism. And it was a very eclectic uh, conference, nomadism being explained in the most uh, broad of terms. And um, there was one speaker who got up and talked about um, the success that Israel had had in settling its nomads. And, um, and the reaction by the other people at the conference was really to condemn that. Say, why, why do you have to settle the nomads? Why can't you simply bring services to them, educate them, give them health care, and let them continue their life? And, um, um, and then some, uh, some other people said, well, the thing about these settled nomads is when they settle down in the community, they don't keep it clean, they don't uh, maintain it, they don't thrive. And the whole question of whether uh, the animal-based economies um, uh, are passing away or should pass away, or, um, or whether there is some fundamental injustice uh, that gets visited upon animal breeders um, uh, in some situations. Animals and transportation and material culture and use of energy, the, this is the thrust of where my thinking is now. And if it combines old ideas and new ideas, uh, my last, I mean, this is, this is just the way I think. Mm -hmm. So use the continuation uh, in the, on the, uh, about the importance of transportation from the early Islamic history, maybe before that, uh, to nine, late 19th century, late 20th century. But uh, I mean, production is not something that is uh, wholly important. Uh, it's transportation means a lot. So you're highlighting that. Is it the point that you, uh, well, th there is a concept that you're putting vis-a-vis -vis Karl Marx's concept of mode of production. So you're translating is as mode of transportation. Uh, and uh, may I quote your words? Um, so you're saying, since recounting this history over four decades ago in The Camel and the Wheel, I've been disheartened that historians have not followed up on the idea that the Arab conquests were not the beginning but the culmination of a long-term shift in economic and political power toward camel pastoralists and caravan merchants. And this is not 
the one and only of its kind. So after well, 40 years have passed since you suggested uh, this, this uh, thesis, have you seen other such cases in history that having a bigger impact on one, it may be one animal or other factors that is, uh, that is having such a great impact because camel caravans, due to the very peculiar nature of camels as animals, had that feature. And this is very peculiar. And this happened on a geography where Islam expanded and grown, etc. Uh, what about the other um, geographies, other means of transportations? Have you ever come across similar thing that you can make a comparison with? Yes, yes. It's um, an area of extensive publication and research interest in the Western Hemisphere, um, where you had um, European domestic animals that were completely unknown in the Western Hemisphere, brought in by settlers, and had all sorts of impacts, um, not simply uh, horses, but um, donkeys and um, uh, pigs and sheep and goats. Um, for example, uh, one of the areas I've gotten very interested in is the rise of the dairy industry. And why is it that certain parts of the world have a very extensive dairy industry, uh, particularly Europe and North America, and other parts of the world, China, for example, uh, at least uh, before the uh, before the, uh, the world wars, China had no dairy industry. And, you know, you can relate that to, uh, to having uh, tolerance for lactose uh, in genetically spread more in some regions than in others. Uh, but it also has to do with, with the energy uh, budget of a society so that if you have a dairy society, your herds of cattle are mostly female, and yet you're producing 50% male calves that you have no need for, no use for. You don't want to have 50% of your males uh, growing to maturity. Their bulls are difficult animals. So you can eat them, but you can't eat all of them. Uh, a, at the time it is weaned, a calf you know, will weigh a couple of hundred pounds. You're not going to eat all that food. Um, so more commonly, you castrate the animals, the males, and you sell them for labor so that the dairy industry produces uh, animal labor as a unsaleable byproduct or a, a, a less valuable byproduct. The primary byproduct is the milk uh, and the cheese and the yogurt and the iron and things like that. Uh, and then they have these male animals. We'll sell them off and let people use them for plowing or caravan work or whatever. So that the result is that in a dairying culture, the the cost of the male labor, of the male animal labor, is um, is to some degree uh, underwritten by the greater value of the milk that's produced. In a society that doesn't have a dairy industry, because too many of the citizens are um, are intolerant of lactose. Uh, there, you don't have as many cheap male animals because you're not maximizing the females in the herd. And so the cost of your uh, of labor, of animal labor is a little bit higher. And the example that I come up with is that um, if you look at overland trade in China, uh, you know, camel caravans would come as far as Beijing across Central Asia. But pretty much in the rest of China, um, if you had overland trade, modal overland communication, they did not they used they did not use ox carts or other kinds of carts very much. Um, 
They did not use pack animals all that much. The most common um, uh, means of carrying goods overland in uh, China down really into the 20th century was using wheelbarrows with men pushing them. And the wheelbarrow would often have a mast and a little sail on it. So that you could use the wind to help you push the wheelbarrow. You might have, I've seen photographs where you'll have like 50 wheelbarrows in a row, like a caravan of, of men pushing wheelbarrows. And I think that that's an indication that the cost of human labor was less than the cost of, uh, of animal labor because you did not have this cheap animal labor underwritten by, by the uh, dairy industry. Or you look at a place like Japan, which up until 1800 or so did not had almost no use of wheeled vehicles at all. Um, when you look at the at the main highways linking um, Kyoto and Edo, the count the two capitals, uh, one along the coast and one through the mountains, um, they don't use. Um, you know, wheel vehicles. There are no carts. There are no wagons. Uh, they carry either their men carry goods, um, or the uh, um, or or the goods are carried on pack animals, because the the cost of human labor was cheaper than the cost of animal labor. One of the thing, the problem with wheeled vehicles, of course, is that you have to have a road, and building a road is expensive. Uh, there has been research published about uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, is it economically, it was mostly uh, sort of early 20th century research, still in the colonial era, people say, is it better to continue having a row of porters carrying loads on their heads or to build a railroad? And they would conclude that the railroad will produce um, cheaper uh, prices um, in the marketplace because you'll move more goods faster at less expense. But the cost of building the railroad has to be amortized over that. And supposing you build a railroad and it doesn't carry enough passenger freight to underwrite the cost of the railroad. And so you have these people debating, was it better just to continue to carry loads on their head or to build a railroad? Um, one thing they don't, they never, seem to consider is what they did in Japan, which was that they built railroads that did not have locomotives. They built railroads in Japan and in Taiwan as a Japanese colony in which they pushed the cars on the tracks. <laughs> and Japan had 70 different push railroad stretches where um, you'd push to the top of the, top of the hill and then <laughs> You'd hop on and you'd ride down. And the interior of Taiwan, which was mostly jungle when the Japanese uh, occupied it, the interior was opened up, not by, um, not by a cart path to carry jungle products to the seaport, but rather by push railroads, which were much cheaper to build. You did not have to have a, the width of a cart. You could have a, much, you could have a narrow gauge uh, railroad. And the, the human labor was cheap um, because you did not have any cheap animal labor, but you did have cheap human labor. So I think that the that in the broad sense, the history of transportation has to do with um, uh, not simply the cost of the of the goods that you're delivering, but also the relative cost of using um, other other means. You know, it, there's so much room for a much more sophisticated world perspective on transportation history and the material underpinnings of transportation history. But I, I really feel that this is an area where, uh, where historians will be able to work productively for, uh, for a generation. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, very, I mean, very interesting talk. Um, uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I'm sure our um, listeners enjoyed that too. Um, thank you very much for this wonderful talk.
uh, and also I wish uh, a good day to everyone and hope to see them in the next episode of Ilham Istanbul Talks. And thank you, Professor, again. Thank you, Farouk. It was a pleasure being here. Thanks.